The Plainville Board of Education Preparing students for success in a changing global society. I'm Mac Guarino, the principal at the middle school, and um, in honor of Board Appreciation Month, uh, I've invited the middle school chamber choir, chamber group, to sing for you today. Uh, they were so kindly accepted. I don't think you got the full group there, but you got a good selection. So this is Todd Helming. He's the a music teacher and choral, one of the choral directors, teachers at the middle school, and a um, wonderful group of middle school students. So I'll turn it over to you. They're going to sing you a couple of songs.
Excuse me, I know all you young ladies are going to get ready to leave. We just wanted to say thank you very much for your beautiful singing. Everybody usually leaves, so we never get to thank them while they're here. I just wanted to tell you that before you guys left, before we start our meeting. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. We're going to call the meeting to order. Um, well, first, we're going to stand and say the Pledge of Allegiance. Ms. Palmieri, would you lead us? Sure. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, before we get to our special presentations, I just want to thank the young ladies that were here singing. I know they've all left, but I want to say it on camera. They were wonderful. It sent chills down my spine. It was just beautiful. So thank you very much. I think we should give them another round of applause. And this is a great month. Thank you guys for everything, especially the chocolate, the notepad. You can never have enough notepads and the beautiful flowers. But thank you, everybody, for all the gifts. All right, we're going to move on to our Everyday Hero presentation, Dr. Brummett. Very good. Good evening. I'm thrilled to once again have several nominations for Everyday Hero. The first nomination this evening is Lynn Legoyk, who was nominated by Shara Ramos, one of our former everyday heroes. Uh, so it's what goes around comes around. Um, here's what Shara says about Lynn Legoyk, principal of Tafalon Elementary School. As I read Dr. Rummett's description of an everyday hero, immediately Mrs. Legoyk came to mind. The everyday hero is described as someone who has made an impact and who makes a difference or makes our district an even better place to be. Lynn more than qualifies. She is a mentor and is always ready to take a moment to help educate me when I ask her to. Over my three years, I've gone to her requesting information on how to do my job better, how to handle a situation, and she gives me excellent advice, information, or material. She was one of the main reasons I look forward to coming to work every day. I cannot think of a better boss to have. I have seen her go out of her way to help staff members with classroom projects, mentoring, scheduling, educating, and even just listening. She is flexible and accommodating while remaining diligent and firm. She is always available to meet with staff if needed and is constantly working on, on or providing ways to help them make their classrooms the best place they can be. Lynn makes an impact on students on a daily basis. I remember in my interview, she mentioned how she loves to educate and that, it's very and that is very apparent when you see Lynn at work and around the children. Her enthusiasm as an educator is like no other. She truly wants each and every one of her students to learn as much as they can. She never turns down a call from a parent and is always diplomatic. <laughs> she works with the parents and the students and the teachers to provide the best plan available to help students reach their goals. Even in the hallways, I have seen her guide a student, giving them a choice to be the best they can be. I cannot tell you how many staff, former staff, students, former students, visitors, or just random people who have shared with me how lucky they feel to have worked with or attended school under the direction of Mrs. Legoyk. Parents have shared with me how well the school is run and how happy they are that their child attends Tafalon. I have seen letters written by former students acknowledging Mrs. Legoyk and thanking her for various reasons. I listen to comments about how people would not want to work under anyone else and express their gratitude toward our principal. Mrs. Legoyk would not want me to gush over her, so I'll keep this short. <laughs> I think you already blew that, but that's okay. Uh, I want to end this to say how grateful I am to have found this position working with her. I look forward to working with her, learning more, and watching the direction she will take this school. 
It is truly a great place to work, and that is because of our everyday hero, Mrs. Lynn Legoyk. We have one more everyday hero in our midst tonight. And this second everyday hero this evening is Jody Muldoon, who was nominated by middle school teacher Allison Rogers. I'd like to nominate Jody Muldoon for the everyday hero. This is her last year of teaching, and throughout her 20 plus years at MSP, she has always gone above and beyond for everyone. Jody and I began teaching together in my second year at MSP. And for the last 12 years, she has been not only my mentor, but also a friend and a second mother. It's difficult to pinpoint a specific reason why Jody deserves this recognition because there are so many. Whether it's planning field trips to Philadelphia, Boston, or New York City, attending student sports games, the Plainville Memorial Day Parade, or MSP concerts, Jody is always there to show how much she cares for her students in and out of the classroom. She is firm and fair with the children and they respect her and love her in return. She was always there for her colleagues as well. I am not the only one who has benefited from her years of wisdom. Many staff members come to Jody for advice, and she always listens and guides them with sound advice. The seventh grade teachers have all come to think of her as the mom in our grade seven family. Jody has helped me to become the teacher that I am today, and she will be greatly missed next year. And that is Jody Muldoon, our next everyday hero. Come on up with your <laughs> nominator. Sure. All right. Well, I was hoping that our Board of Ed student representative Olivia Critella would be here this evening because we were going to pay tribute to her as well. Uh, we understand that last week she received a very important phone call from Senator Chris Murphy, who had let her know that she's been offered a commission to the U.S. Air Force Academy. So we wanted to congratulate her um, and give her a round of applause. So maybe I'll do that next month if she, and if she comes in late, we'll do it at that point. But that's a huge accomplishment. And I know she comes from a very long line of a military family and she's thrilled with this prestigious, in my mind, uh, accomplishment. So uh, uh, one of our graduates doing a great thing. All right, I think I'll just stay here. And uh, <laughs> I wanted to point out that, again, that tonight is the Board of Ed Appreciation um, this is where we spend time honoring our board members and they are in many ways our everyday heroes because they work for no, it's a volunteer, there's no uh, pay for this job and it's very time consuming. And I have to say this, our board members are very dedicated as I interface with a lot of other superintendents in the, in the state and even folks who I work with who work in other districts and all of that. They tell me that our board members are very visible and they're in the schools a lot. They're part of P 
PTO groups. They're going to a lot of our functions. Some of our board members have even started attending instructional rounds. And that's not typical for Board of Education members. That's very unique. So I appreciate what our schools have done this evening and the tribute that our middle school chamber singers made. And I just want to appreciate our board. They work hard and, and they serve our children very well. Thank you. Dr. Bromet, we will work for chocolate. <laughs> well, and I think I can restate what I just said a few moments oh, ago. Oh, there she is. Hey. Olivia. Hey. <laughs> you don't want to weather clapping for you? Olivia, we were talking about you behind your back. Um, <laughs> we were talking about that outstanding phone call you got from... Senator Chris Murphy recently, and where he appointed you or offered you a commission to the U.S. Air Force Academy. And we want to thank you in advance for the service that you're going to do for our country and for this amazing accomplishment. And then we clapped. <laughs> so congratulations. That's amazing and wonderful. All right, let me get my act together here. I believe the next item is... Board of Ed approval of minutes? Yep. Okay, I just need a motion for approval of the February 13th minutes. Madam Chairman, I move we accept the minutes of the February 13th, 2017 minutes of the Board of Education's regular meeting as circulated to the board. Second. second. All right, I have a first and a second. Any additions or corrections? All right, all those in favor? Aye. All right, any opposed? Okay. Um, Citizens' comments, anyone wishing to speak to the Board of Education can just go right up there where Dr. Brummett is, state your name and address, and you can speak to the board. Anyone? Mr. Chase, come on up. Young Mr. Chase. Yeah, I'm sorry, young Mr. Chase. I was <laughs> <laughs> so good evening. My name is young Mr. Chase. <laughs> uh, 48 Metacomet Road. I would like to take a few moments to speak in favor of the Wheeler School renovation project this evening. I have lived in Plainville my entire life and attended Plainville schools beginning at Wheeler back in the early 80s. My own children are currently attending Wheeler and are receiving the same great education that I did. Even though 30 plus years have gone by, Wheeler's overall appearance hasn't changed. The facilities department has done a phenomenal job preserving the condition of the building, but it is in need of physical, mechanical, and technological updates. I am fortunate enough to teach at Plainville High School and see firsthand how imperative it is that we keep our buildings updated and current to meet all the state mandated requirements. Every school building in town except Wheeler has modern day technologies such as secure entryways and updated security features. These new types of technology can be monitored wirelessly and viewed by local authorities in the event of an emergency. In addition, many of Wheeler's mechanical systems, roofs, roof, Windows, doors, and ceilings are in desperate need of updates and repairs. With current reimbursement we qualify for, it would address all of these issues and more, at little or no cost to us as taxpayers. If we do not receive this reimbursement from the state, these issues will still need to be addressed individually and will end up costing the taxpayers more money over time. The state has these funds allocated and available now, and if Plainville does not take advantage of this opportunity, than some other municipality will. We deserve to benefit from these state funds, which in turn will make Plainville even more appealing and increase our property values. The Wheeler Project would create a town of completely modernized schools. This would be an incredible accomplishment for our town and a great source of pride. None of this would be possible without the continuous efforts of our Board of Education, so thank you, the Town Council, and Town Administration, who have always done what is best for Plainville and its residents. Thank you for your support and consideration on this project. Thank you, Mr. Chase. Thank you, Mr. Chase. I uh, just want to mention that, yes, we are, it is slated for us to approve tonight, but understand that's one part of the process. It will have to go to the council who decides on the money, so you should absolutely bring your speech and go there when they have the public hearing before the referendum, so thank you. Um, anyone else? Okay, we'll move on. Um, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead, Becky, sorry. I didn't see you. Hello, my name is Becky Martinez, um, e. Irving Street. I'm here to support the Wheeler renovation. I have a son in first grade and another little one who will be attending in a couple of years. 
As a parent, I'm here to support the increase in safety and security measures and the much needed mechanical and physical updates that this renovation would provide. As a taxpayer, I'm here to support doing this project now because, because it is the right time and the right place. We are in a time now where we can get the 65% refund from the state if we act quickly. And this is a great place because our Board of Education, Town Council, and our town has done a great job at keeping our debt services in a good place and now we are lowering our debt services as we move on. Our debt services is in a place where we are able to absorb the cost of this project. So I am here to support the, the Wheeler renovation and looking forward to see all of the things that it can bring the high school, the middle school, and Wheeler Elementary School while being so responsible financially and not raising our taxes. Thank you. Thank you, Becky. Thank you so much. Anyone else? I don't want to miss anybody this time. Sorry. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <clears throat> our council liaison is in a budget work session, so she cannot be here tonight. And we'll go on to the superintendent's report. Dr. Brummett. <coughs> All right. I'd like now to invite uh, Mr. Ken Biega from ONG Architects and Chuck Boos from Castle Boos to provide an overview of the recommendations of our capital building projects. The three of us tonight will discuss the scope and cost to replace the middle school roof the paving and site work here at Plainville High, and of course the Wheeler project that several citizens have spoken about tonight. So without further ado, we're gonna give the public a little more detail about these projects before the board votes on that later this evening. Thank you, Dr. Brummett. Uh, Chuck Booz here from Castle Booz. Uh, the uh, Plainville projects uh, consist of uh, three uh, separate projects, actually. We have the uh, renovate as new for the Wheeler School, which means that the building will be completely updated to meet current codes and all uh, building systems and facilities will uh, be installed to meet a 20 year service life. The uh, work on the middle school uh, involves uh, a re-roofing of that particular project uh, and the work on uh, the high school is really a site project. Uh, the uh, all paving and some site structures that are out of date uh, and uh, some uh, uh, drainage structures have collapsed, they will be replaced and brought up to, uh, to standards. Okay, we just did that. <laughs> uh, this is a graphic of the, um, uh, of the middle school roof uh, that uh, it indicates that all of the uh, flat roofs uh, will be completely replaced. They're shown in the red uh, U, uh, and the uh, yellow color indicates where the uh, metal roofs are, and uh, they uh, will be bid as, as an alternate. Next slide. Indi indicating the uh, amount of site work that uh, all the paving that will be replaced on the uh, uh, high school project. Next and uh, the graphic of the uh, Wheeler School, uh, which, which we'll, we'll get into this a little, in a little more in detail, but uh, this is just an overall view uh, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the site. The, the site will also be renovated. Uh, we'll have uh, the ball fields and playscapes uh, will be uh, uh, renewed. Uh, the, the, paved, the paved areas uh, will be redone with a new uh, boulevard type uh, entrance for safety, one lane in, one lane out. Uh, the parent drop off will be created at this location at a new main entrance. Uh, and uh, we have a connect, connecting link between the two uh, wings of the building to facilitate circulation within the building. Next, please. The, uh, this is the plan of the building, and the uh, tan areas are areas that indicate relatively light renovation. We're not talking about uh, major uh, wall relocations and, and, and the like, uh, so, but they will all be brought up to, uh, to current standards. The areas in green uh, are areas where we have heavier renovation. 
Uh, for instance, uh, this area up here, there's a lot of storage going on, uh, and, and there's one classroom there, and that has been recaptured into two classrooms. Uh, where the existing uh, office area is, uh, that will be converted into two pre-K classrooms. The uh, entrance will be modified slightly so to make it secure, uh, so that nobody can come in and out uh, without uh, being uh, Ad admitted either electronically or actually physically by uh, an attendant. Uh, this is uh, the renovated kitchen. This is the new area for the uh, office and nurse. Uh, and uh, the mechanical area is being completely redone because we're going to have a completely new mechanical energy efficient system throughout. Uh, the roof will be completely replaced on this building as well. Uh, and all uh, hazardous materials will be removed. Next, please. This is a, a graphic of what the front entrance might look like, uh, which is on the side now, uh, which will be the uh, uh, immediately adjacent to uh, the, the parking lot, a lot easier for uh, visitors and parents to come and go. And again, that entrance is completely secured uh, with uh, you know, electronics. Next. And again, these are the three projects. We talked about the middle school is roofing, uh, Plainville High School is site improvements, and Wheeler is a complete upgrade of everything, including the site uh, and uh, all facilities within. The building will be essentially a like new building. Next. Can we go back to that slide? Just in case, yeah. All right. Good evening, everybody. Ken Biega from ONG. I just want to kind of go over the estimates a little bit so you can understand it because there's always a lot of questions about the reimbursement, reimbursement rate. If you remember, the discussion is you have 65% reimbursement back from the state. But if you actually look at the numbers, you're not getting the 65% back on those items, you know, the total, especially Wheeler, which is your biggest chunk of money there. You'll see you're getting roughly 51.5% back on the total cost of that project. Now everyone says, okay, why? Any contingency item is not eligible to, for reimbursement until the paperwork is filed with the state. What that means is as a change order occurs, we have to price it out. We have to get a cost for that. The engineers have to sign off on it. The building committee has to sign off on it. The board of ed superintendent also look at it and sign off on it too. Then it goes to the state and the state says whether it's eligible for reimbursement. So we always show that as contingencies are not eligible. We want to be on the conservative side because there's nothing worse than going to the taxpayers and say, well, it actually the project cost us more. If anything, we're conservative, so you'll actually get more money back from the state. So that's in all the projects. Now everyone looks at it and says the high school. Well, the high school is not eligible for any real major reimbursement items. We didn't want to show anything there. There are other possibilities. We have the handicap ramp down by the tennis courts. We can apply for that. But it's such a small amount of money, we didn't want to forecast that and be like, well, how come we never didn't get anything? So that's the option there. Uh, the roof, you'll see that's closer to your reimbursement. The change, why you're not getting the 65% there, is the contingency. All that money is held off until it is actually used, okay? So the other question that everyone has is, okay, how do we know if the money's going to be there? Well, if you look at it, you're going to be applying. You, well, if the referendum passes, you apply by June 30th. Your cycle, the money would become available the following June. So you really wouldn't start any full construction until you know that the state has the money in place for you. All right, now this being a long session and everything coming up, it won't, you know, it won't be a problem this summer, but the next summer it's gonna be a short session so the money should be available early because there's been times when it's been a long session that the legislators take some time and the money doesn't get sent into place and it holds up some of these projects because a lot of towns hold off on it. So that's you know, your safety net there because when you talk to the taxpayers, you say, Unless the money's there, we're not actually going to enter into construction contracts to start any work. Now, you always have the option. You could look at the high school parking lot and say, well, since we're not getting any reimbursement there, we could just proceed and get that done. But that's a decision that the council will make. But, you know, if you're answering questions with the different taxpayers, you want to go over that with them. Um, the other issue is the state has been changing their policy on what they look as what's eligible. All right, so they may come out with some different changes in June, but if you're filing before then, you should be all set because there's always a concern they're going to lower the reimbursement rates. So, you, you know, that's 
but we've heard that before, but I think this year is a lot different than previous years, so we have to watch that. Other than that, um, the Wheeler School, the biggest concern we have there is the hazardous material, all right, is of course the PCBs and stuff like that. But we have an allowance for that and what we've experienced in other projects. We've also done some preliminary testing of some material above the ceiling because there's actually two ceilings there. You have the drop ceiling and there's another ceiling above. So we did some testing on that to make sure there's no surprises, checking that for asbestos material. We did not test for PCBs, but we're carrying money in the estimate for PCBs. So if everything goes right, you know, that shouldn't be an issue. And we're also looking at a phase project on this. All right, there was some discussions on having portables. We pulled the portables off of this project and we said, let's do it as a renovation project, which means we kind of moved the classrooms around. So what I'm thinking about and talking to Andrew, the principal, taking the teacher's faculty lounge, making it to a temporary classroom, splitting that up so we can move the kids, renovate the classrooms. They go in that space, we renovate it, we move them back to their room. So we're not gonna be moving the kids too much. We try just to move them once with inside the school. All right, and then sometimes we get creative. We have to do art on the cart, music on the cart when we renovate their rooms. But it's something we coordinate with the faculty. Okay. And I don't think anyone's mentioned tonight that Wheeler will now have air conditioning as a result of this project, and that's important. But just to, summar excuse me, just to summarize this slide, the total estimated cost of all three projects is $27,367,892. However, with the state reimbursements as outlined in the upper part of that uh, slide, the net cost to taxpayers is $13.9 million. But on the next slide, I wanted to show you something very, very important in one of our Citizens Ms. Martinez uh, discussed this in her comments, is the town has done a wonderful job of budgeting and planning for projects. And as you can see on this slide, the red line represents existing debt. And right now our debt service is, is declining at a, very <clears throat> at a very nice clip. And it, it's been pre-planned that when it starts to decline, the town would look toward new projects so that the debt service never goes up, but that we're getting things done in the meantime because though times are tight at the state, the state still endorses building projects because it's good for communities, it's good for education, and it's good for the property values of your community to have all really top-notch schools that are good for kids, good learning environments. So this chart is showing us that while that debt service is dropping off is the time for us to put a project in place i.e. the three that we just talked about, and it will not lead to increased taxes for, for the community. Um, I give hats off to our town financial folks who've done a great job of pre-planning this, and as that time goes along, because right now the debt that's falling off, believe it or not, is from the Linden Project years ago, and we're just backfilling with new projects while not burdening the taxpayers. And the next slide shows a very similar um, tax implication, which is that our debt service just m maintains a constant level. And the f final column that's in red shows the Im implications for taxpayers. What you're paying in taxes for this debt service as a town member <laughs> is not going to change for the foreseeable future because we're just backfilling things that have already been paid off. So that makes this optimal, an optimal time to do a project like this. I meet with other superintendents throughout the state who are doing building projects, and very few of them can say this. Most building projects of this magnitude cause tax, taxes to go up, quite frankly, but because of the debt service in town and the timing of it all, that will not be the case for Plainville. So I think that just speaks to the timing of all this and the importance of capitalizing on state reimbursements while we know what they are. And the next slide, I believe, is just another rendering of the exterior of uh, Wheeler. Just to recap, the entrance now for drop-off of students will be on the side of, of the school. The front entrance will strictly be a bus drop-off during the morning hours, and the side en entrance will be a main entrance now, and it'll be like a boulevard approach where cars drive in, take a loop around and come out. There'll be increased parking, increased uh, orderliness to the, the morning drop-off, which is very important, and as discussed previously, a high level of security for both entrances. And as Mr. Booz mentioned, a connector on the back of the building. Not only does it connect so that the kids um, can go from one end of the building to the other without going outside, which is nice, it's a prime location to where playground is, so that if kids get little boo-boos at recess, they come right into the nurse who's gonna be at the back of the building. Um, and 
the connector in my mind too is, is a high level of security for us. This way kids are not going out unless they're going out for recess and they can come right to the nurse's office by cutting through there or coming from the other part of the building. So I think it's all a very uh, well-designed building. And with that, we're willing to answer any questions that you might have about the project. And obviously we'll be doing a lot of um, informing of the community as the next few weeks and uh, months roll along. I didn't have, I just had a comment. I wanted to thank Mr. Biego and Mr. Booth for coming in because we had a couple of board members that couldn't attend the meeting last week. So I thank you for coming again and uh, clarifying the reimbursement because we just want to make sure people understand so they don't feel like we're not giving them the correct information. So thank you very much. Does anyone have any questions? No. No? Well done. Thank actually, you. Guys. Oh, actually, go just one kind of quick question. The area where the, where is, it's going to, is currently the front drop off and it's going to become the bus area is that going to be bigger than it currently is right now or is that about the same size and just it, it's about the same size it, it's, it's sort of restrictive to, to uh, the area uh, but the uh, uh, it, it should work much better with the, uh, uh, the, the lack of confusion uh, with the parent drop-off Thank you guys very much. Thank, Thank you, you very you. much. <clears throat> Good night. Take care. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, <coughs> now on to the next part of the superintendent's report, the elementary, state of the elementary schools presentation. I would now like to invite our elementary principals up, Lynn Legoyk, recent award-winning <laughs> <laughs> Actually, this is a stellar crew. They've all been every day heroes at one point or another. Uh, so Paula Eshu and Andrew Batchelder, they will also be joined this evening by elementary curriculum coordinator Tawana Graham Douglas and math and science instructional leader Phil Sanders and math resource teacher Alicia Adorado. So we have a, quite a crew here presenting. They've prepared a presentation on the wonderful and innovative things that are happening at our elementary schools this year. Dr. Broma, did you tell them they only had five minutes? Yeah. <laughs> no, rehearsal was a little longer than that, but it's a very good report. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Brummett. Good evening, Board of Ed members. Dr. Brummett, Mr. LePage, thanks for allowing us to speak tonight and uh, describe a state of our elementary schools. Um, as our first slide indicates, this is where it all begins. And of course, it has a strong touch of Principal Eshu with the We Rock notation. She loves to say that. Um, and we do rock. And our second slide, as always, our three rings and all they encompass remain at the forefront of our thinking as they fundamentally guide our work and decisions for students teaching and learning. Next. And our overview tonight, you're going to hear about um, the writing units of study that we use at the elementary school, highlight on the informational writing specifically, problem solving and math, which we had a great focus on this year, and innovative practices, such as makerspace at Toflon, student-led conferences at Wheeler, and lesson study at Linden. Good evening. Thank you so much for allowing us to speak to you this evening. Principal Eshu just mentioned that um, Principal Legoyk was great at delegating because she was saying that she didn't want to do this entire presentation alone. <laughs> so that's why you have the 25 of us up here helping her out. So it takes a village. It takes a village. That is so true. Um, we began implementing the new writing units of study during the 15-16 school year. The workshop model is based on 30 years of research about skills and strategies around what good readers and good writers use. Each grade level has four units of study per year, and they learn and students learn how to write in three different genres, narrative, informational, and persuasive. The fourth unit of study is a second unit based on one of those three genres. This evening, we've included examples of student work from their informational unit. You will notice the progression of student development as the pieces go from simple how-to procedural text in kindergarten 
to research reports within the context of social studies related to topics in fourth and fifth grade. The beauty of tonight's presentation is that you will hear their voices. The students and their work will speak for themselves. We invite you to take a listen. We're gonna start with kindergarten and you will notice that in kindergarten, students write how-to books. They write how-to books as a way to learn how to use their personal experiences to communicate with others using pictures and words. First graders pretend to be experts and teach each other about topics that they are truly passionate about. They write multiple chapter books with each chapter giving you more information and details about a topic. Now second grade has the distinction of having two informational units. Second graders write lab reports and they also write expository texts. In lab reports, they explore the scientific method. They conduct experiments, they record their hypothesis and trials, they record their results and draft conclusions. For their expository texts, they build on their learning in kindergarten and in first grade and they focus on their introduction the accuracy of their facts and their conclusions. All right, third grade. As you can see, students continue on with informational writing and you can notice just by looking at it, the increase in the, the sophistication that happens between second grade and third grade. Next, we have fourth grade. In fourth grade, students move into writing research reports with the goal of engaging the readers checking their facts, and using the most effective structure to teach a topic. And then finally, in fifth grade, students engage in the full writing process. They do research, they write a first draft, they revise it, they write a second draft, and they learn how to think like a historian and use primary and secondary sources of information. So by fifth grade, it gets pretty sophisticated. In the next slide, I'm gonna show you just a little quick uh, insight into some second graders. Second graders did their expert books. They learned a lot about a topic and they wrote their reports and then they filmed them with the green screen behind them. And so we have two quick ones to show you. There's Tiger, of course it's Taflon. We don't, <laughs> we don't have any wolves or Linden tunas or whatever you are. <laughs> <laughs> Dolphins. <laughs> so we don't. Tigers, yeah. And then we have uh, a little guy who did the spider. So take a look. Good afternoon. My name is Madison, and I read three books about tigers. Hope you enjoy. Tigers are the biggest cats in the world. They're as long as five adult men. Tigers live in forests, Russia, Indonesia, cold places, or swamps. All tigers eat meat. They eat deer, wild pigs, and monkeys. Male tigers weigh more than 500 pounds. A female tiger usually has four to, wait, two to four cubs at a time. Hi, good afternoon. I'm Alexander. I read three or four books about spiders. There are 3,000 different kinds of spiders. If a female spider is hungry, it will eat the male spider. <laughs> spider babies are called spiderlings. The red mark on a black widow warns other animals not to eat it. And there's our second graders. <laughs> that was cute. Good evening, everybody. Sometimes the principals will eat the male <laughs> math. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we're going to talk about some problem solving in mathematics. As a district-wide goal, we decided to focus on problem solving, uh, pro uh, math practice number one, which is make sense of problems and perseverance solving them. Uh, through our PLCs, teachers uh, created numberless problems across every grade level. These problems help students to focus on uh, the understanding of what the problem is all about. It helps them to learn the relationships between the numbers. They also encourage uh, also lots of student conversation and dialogue back and forth about what's going on. 
as well as activate the background knowledge. And that's one of the big things. We really try to get the kids to tap into what they already know about the problem before having to actually solve it. Finally, they promote student engagement and cooperative learning. And you'll see a little video showing that in a few seconds. Another part that made the implementation of this uh, successful so far is that we had a teacher planning process. So as part of the teacher planning process, our teachers were able to come together in professional learning communities, or PLCs, to select the problems collaboratively together that they wanted to use in their classroom instruction. Um, and then that work carried over into their building grade levels at math grade level meetings. Teams of grade level teachers actually deconstructed the problems to make them numberless and then created the slideshows, what they shared out with their grade level colleagues across the district. Um, and then we were able to subsequently come back together in an additional PLC to go ahead and look at the instructional strategies we used and decide if there was any revision that we wanted to uh, make to the slideshows or to our instruction in general. And doing it in this way has made sure that we've consistently given every child in, across the district the same um, access to our math curriculum. Short and sweet, we have a short video of students, a group of students who are actually going through a problem. I believe this is third, uh, second grade uh, group backyard bird count, and you'll see their process and the things that they get to talk about and things we've been promoting um, in terms of their discussion. All right, so the problem is about these two girls, and it was a big bird count. And um, Sally and Bella wanted to compare this year's and last year's birds. So now, they, they have charts that they did it on, and uh, so now we need to add numbers. To, we need to add, for this, last year, we had to add 181 and 45 and 60, which that got 186. And then for this year, we had to add 76 plus 30 plus 62, which equals 168. So now they're asking, uh, well, Bella and Sally disagree with each other. So now they're asking us who is correct. And we know that Bella is correct because her answer was 186. Yeah, because 186 is greater than 168. Yeah. First we looked at the tens. I meant to say the hundreds, but... Well, yeah, the hundreds first, but they were equal to. So then we had to look at these, and they weren't equal to. Yeah. And so then we noticed that, oh, 186 is correct. So that would be that one. <coughs> so Bella is correct. And then we wrote our answer. Bella is correct because 186 is greater than 168. So I think in general, the, one of the big takeaways from the problem solving is that the students are not asked to come up with a numerical answer. That's part of the process. You can see in this problem, the question is who is correct? So they have to find an answer and then defend it. And I think that's a big, a big step in, in the right direction for our kids. Thank you. Mrs. Legoyk says tuna. I, I, I hope gonna, there's going to be a night when we come to present the elementary um, state night when we present like we did every year. I've been here three years, and each time Mrs. Legoyk always throws a little pot shot at Mrs. Eshelman. <laughs> I can't wait to the night we can come and congratulate Mrs. Legoyk for not throwing the little dig at Mrs. <laughs> Really. Innovative practices. Uh, as you know, at our convocation back in August, Dr. Brummett set a tone of encouragement to take risk and in engaging in some innovative instructional practices. Next. The first one we will share comes directly from Chapter 5 of this book, Leaders of Our Own Learning, and they are student-led conferences. So this year we were very fortunate to have Mrs. Karen Miller, fifth grade teacher at Wheeler, pilot student-led conferences. Under her guidance and direction, students spent their entire first quarter this year analyzing their own work and placing pieces of evidence of their own learning into folders in preparation for their student-led parent-teacher conference. The results of these student-led conferences were very positive. We found that students increased ownership for their learning and developed a greater understanding of themselves as learners. 
Students developed greater communication skills. They learned how to talk about themselves, describe their goals, strengths, and areas to improve in, similar to a job interview. And the overall process increased family engagement. So here's a short video clip where you will see a student-led conference in action. Um, this piece of work um, shows my understanding and how I'm working toward reaching my, go my goals because I'm, um, I'm underlining only the important parts. And it looks like I'm underlining a lot, because, but it's just um, since it's a lot, but I'm really only underlining the important things. Yes, there was a lot in that problem, so it would be, there was a lot to underline. A lot of important things. Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, 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 I'm also using Find No Show more often when I actually need it because if I needed it, I, I just like wouldn't take the time to think if I needed it or not, and I would just like keep going, and, and then I would have trouble organizing my work and problems. Um, another thing is that I'm writing more about how I solve the problem and about the answer. That's you. That was you. Yeah. Oh, so she explained her answer in a sentence. I'm going to make it really low, so go ahead with the jokes, I know. And I'm just going to say that dolphins have a highly developed communication system. They're graceful and peaceful, yeah. right? I'm just saying. They aren't wolves or tigers. Sorry. Okay, at Linden, um, we did what I called lesson study. I didn't know what else to call it. I know they're doing it as well in the academic arts, and it was an alternative to rounds. Um, so, because it, having all the guest teachers in the building so that teachers could go watch other teachers um, just seemed to be counterproductive for us. So we decided at a grade level meeting that we would all teach the same um, mini lesson, and then each teacher in the grade level videotaped that mini lesson and then during a grade level meeting, we watched those mini lessons together, which are about 10 minutes each. And they had the form in front of them, I notice, and I wonder. And we wanted it to be so that they would share out what they saw and what they noticed and not have it feel evaluative or um, that anybody was judging. And, um, and so this is what the teacher said about the process um, of doing that lesson study. So what I really <laughs> liked about it was the fact that I was able to see the way everyone taught. So even though we all taught the same lesson, I saw that it was taught in every in lots of different ways. So if I ever need to reteach that or I have students that aren't understanding it, I can teach it in one of the ways that you taught it and perhaps they'll be able to understand that better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, kind of going off of that, I personally feel like I learned the most when I watch other teachers teach. And like you said, I might see something. So I might see something that you guys do and think, oh, I'm going to take that back to my classroom now. And it's, yeah, I think that that's how I learn the most. Yeah, I think that was really great to watch everybody. But then I think we don't normally watch ourselves. So it gave us the opportunity to really have to watch ourselves back and self-reflect on what we were doing if we saw something work really well or um, something we might change. And it gave us a chance to see more of the kids a little bit too, mm -hmm. how they listened. <laughs> And for me as a new teacher, it was nice to see the examples of models of how it should be done and different ways to do it that is um, the right way or a way to do it. <laughs> All right, thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right, and the innovative practice that I decided to share with you is Makerspace, and if you want to uh, learn more about it after I'm done at the uh, Superintendent Showcase on April 19th, 19th uh, we're doing a little more of a presentation with students. So Makerspace, what's that all about? We've been doing it for two years now, and twice a month we turn our library into a Makerspace and ask any student at Toflon School and they'll tell you Makerspace days are their best days of the year. Makerspace is a place where students use science and math and engineering, they use art and music and other skills to solve problems. And uh, this video is gonna show you a little bit more about the kinds of things that go on at Makerspace.
I know that Mr. Batchelder and I um, are looking forward to bringing makerspace to our schools and we've been starting to um, do some of that as well. So um, on behalf of all of the elementary um, professionals that you see behind me, um, we'd like to thank you for all of your hard work and dedication to our children of Plainville. And um, thank you for the opportunity to show off what we've been doing. Do you have any questions? Does anyone have any questions? Nobody? I didn't know there were 3,000 kinds of spiders. You know what, Mr. Green? <laughs> <Perino? laughs> you know I was going to say rock on, but not rock on to you. <laughs> to Paula, Paul, I had a quick question. Um, yes. So uh, you had the, the three practices you talked about were student-led conferences, lesson study, and makerspace, and those seem to be all at different schools. Do you, and I heard you say the ma you hope to get the makerspace. Are you, mm -hmm. you going to get the other ones? It's like, are all the kids going to get, in each school, going to get all three of those? or? So with the, with the book that we read, all the books, all the um, three schools read the book. And okay. we're kind of doing our um, letting staff uh, kind of direct what they would like to do, do using that book. So like, for instance, at Linden, we have learning targets, and we're looking for those in the classroom. And then um, assess, formative assessments using those targets. And um, I think, you know, the staff is moving towards that, but they're just not quite there yet with everything that's going on in the, in the year. Um, so I know that they were very excited to watch the video of the student-led conferences. Um, I don't know if I'm speaking okay for you. And then um, as far as the rounds, Lynn, has, uh, Mrs. Legoyk has always done rounds at Tafalon, and they're very effective there, and they um, go into each other's classrooms. Um, for us, we were just finding that we weren't having the, the teachers coming in, the guest teachers. So, like, I'd have to cancel everything that was planned. So I said, let's try this and see if it worked, and teachers really liked it. So it depends on what works for the okay. staff um, for their learning um, over time. And, you know, of course, the things that are really best practices, we would replicate at the three schools. Thank you. Did anybody else have any other question? I'm sorry, I had one math question. <laughs> Oh, um, I know a few years ago we implemented the new elementary school math program. Yes. And I, I remember at the time, and we had a lot of parents that seemed to be, I think it was a different way of teaching math and didn't understand it. But it based was. on what you showed, it seems like simple math to me. I don't, you know, I don't want to over you know, or underestimate it, but so do you do find you that that's not the case anymore, that parents are more in tune to what the kids are learning and as the kids progress from K up to five and they go through and the parents get exposure to the program through their children's experiences the apprehension and the newness of it has all worn off and it's pretty much fully embraced so it's more acceptable so okay Absolutely, yes. okay yeah, it yeah. does seem to be a lot less but I was just wondering it's it's common core aligned mm -hmm. and, okay. and I think that that was a big shift oh all right and, um, and uh, yeah it's, I'm just it's like addressing. comment on that too that having the ability uh, to look at one of those math classes uh, uh, and doing rounds, the thought came to my mind, if I had been taught mathematics <laughs> that way, I wouldn't have had the problems I had later on with algebra. Uh, that it, it, it's really a logical and easily understandable approach. And, and, uh, and I, I just, I really, I think it's very effective. Yeah. Teachers like it, kids like it, parents like it. Okay, and thank Ms. you. Thank you guys very much. Mr. Sanders and Ms. Uh, Adorado also have done math and science nights at the schools to give the parents even more live exposure. So I think they've done a great job of, of helping parents understand the, the curriculum very well. Thank all of you very much for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. And because no one's going to want to follow the elementary folks, that concludes my superintendent's report <laughs> for the evening. <laughs> all right. Does anybody have any other questions for the superintendent? All right, we'll move on. All right, to our student representatives. Congratulations, Olivia. Thank you. Eight.
the play, the play All My Sons will be this weekend at Rainbow High School. Um, Mr. PHS is going to take place on the 23rd, which is next Thursday, and the Townwide Band Concert is on March 30th. On April 5th, 2017, 9th, 10th, and 11th graders will be taking standardized assessments at PHS. Juniors will be taking the CT School Day SAT. Sophomores will be taking the CAP Science Test. Freshmen will be taking a locally created writing ass assessment. Seniors will be given the opportunity to take part in a college visit, job shadow, or post-secondary planning day. As of right now, the third quarter ends in late March. Uh, in terms of sports, baseball pitchers and catchers will be starting today, and the rest of spring sports officially begin uh, next week. Juniors and seniors are beginning to get ready for prom, which occurs in less than three months. Junior prom is May 20th, and senior prom is June 3rd. Any questions? Thank you guys very much. Okay, I don't think we had facilities or finance or, or um, policy, so we'll move on to, Dr. Roman, do you have anything on the turf committee? We don't, there's okay. been no since our last board right, meeting. Thank you. All right, um, the high school, Mr. White? Yes, the uh, PAC meeting was uh, last week on March 8th. Uh, at that meeting, Dr. Brummett did present a strategic plan to the, to the PAC, and the meeting was well attended. Um, my part of the meeting was to present uh, the highlights of the 2017-18 budget that was presented to the council, and also uh, a good discussion also on the uh, capital building plans that also impact the high school, middle school, and Wheeler. Mr. Medic uh, reported that uh, the NIAC uh, last evaluated the high school in 2009, uh, and the next one uh, has been put up one year to 2020. Uh, he also pointed out that one of the English teachers uh, was uh, rather seriously injured in a ski boarding accident, but uh, Mr. Sieber, who retired last year, was actually coming as a long-term uh, replacement for that. I think the highlight there is that just shows kind of what a family we do have in this building uh, that teachers, when they retire, they're still willing to come back. And the good point of that is that she knows all of the students, so that that worked out, I think, very well for the students. Uh, as was pointed out, uh, April 5th is uh, going to be a test day uh, for all the grades here at, at the high school. And in addition to that day, those grades that are not uh, impacted all day long, uh, ninth and eighth, they will also be participating with the police department uh, in uh, some safety training and, and other related matters for there. And he, uh, Mr. Medic also stated that his goal is to have the new schedules out for the students for next year by June 30th, and hopefully the new four-day schedule uh, at the high school is going to work that out. The uh, PAC uh, officers are also going to meet with the middle school uh, PTO in April uh, to ease in that transition of students. Uh, for everybody's interest, the uh, PAC tag sale is going to be May, uh, May 13th. They were going to try and have a poster here tonight, but I guess uh, printing things have caused that to, to, to delay. But that is one of their prime and remaining fundraiser for the year. The current Treasury currently has a balance of $3,088.66, and that tag sale should provide them enough funds to meet their 2017 obligations. Their next meeting is going to be May 10th. Uh, at the back uh, conference room, and all high school parents are are urged to attend. As a personal note, I, Mr. Medic, and I were the only males in, <laughs> in attendance. I think it'd be great if some dads, especially uh, if the time permits, to do that. Thank you, Foster. Tophlon, Nicole, sure. I know you're new. Do you, did you have a report? Yep, oh, cool. Okay. Um, Tuffalon kicked off the whole school, whole community book last week. Um, they were proud to have Dr. Brummett and Dr. Pettit star in a reader's <laughs> theater based on the book. Um, K through two parents and grandparents have been visiting the Tuffalon music classes. It's been lots of fun for them. And the PTO K through 12 fun night was snowed out last week and moved to April 28th. All right, thank you. Lyndon, Ms. Hardy. We have a budget of $378 for the Lolly Grams. Thank you to the parents, staff who helped make the Grams, divided them amongst the six to seven adults that worked well. Next year, they will send out the Lolly Gram flyer a lot sooner. 
They also had a book fair, uh, a book fair date coming up, which is May 1st through the 5th, and they will set up on Wednesday and for preview for Thursday and Friday, 9 to 12. Friday evening during ice cream social, May 5th. Um, there was a gift for Anna and Elsa, $50 gift card and envelopes to Amazon. There was a, lep a leprechaun bingo, 6.30 to 8. Miss D to do calling. We'll gather the materials and prizes, a bigger prize for the first round and smaller prizes for all in the end. Snack concession stand, a dollar for chips, popcorn, soda, water, juice boxes, um, an invite to go out Monday, non-perishable food items for cards, limit two cards per person. Um, conference snacks, 5.30 to 8. The snacks worked well and the teachers could have a little treat. Um, Yankee Candle fundraiser distributed on March 28th and it will run through April 5th. Hard deadline, morning of April 7th. If you order online, the prices are the same and products delivered right to your home within a few days. And the flyer was created by Ink Candle. We have box tops, to, uh, reminder to families to put names on the contributions, set in, sent in the labels, tops that would have expired. Next shipment will be May and June. Thank you for, thank you to Debbie Nelson for donating the postage to send in the box tops. Um, there's a kid -a -thon scheduled on March 31st, Friday, a pancake breakfast on April 1st will not have the children end in the cafe so that the PTO can set up the cafe for the breakfast. We'll provide fruit and water. There will be a breakfast with the Easter Bunny on April 1st, 8.30 to 11 a.m. Eggs, pancakes, sausage juice, coffee will open for will open for others to purchase within Linden. Ticket for Santa breakfast can Santa breakfast can be handed <laughs> in for Easter. Santa in July. <laughs> Santa got canceled. So this is <laughs> um, okay, the fundraisers, um, they will offer a coupon book for, with better options, not kid stuff, an app for the coupons, guaranteeing a profit usable all over the state, same price per book. We'll look into the future before a decision is made the vendor fair for next year for the holiday season. Um, school photograph, Life Touch a la carte, now will provide the incentives to the school as in the past. Also will sell $15 CDs with which parents can publish as many pictures as desired. Also discuss premiere and new day learning toward Life Touch next year. I think we're done. Wow. <laughs> Thank you. Ms. Eshoo, you're definitely the busiest PTO this month. <laughs> All right, middle school, Crystal? Yeah, we met on February 15th. Um, let's see, we had two events. Um, we had a Zumba night and a yoga night. Um, Joy over at Studio X donated her time for that, and that was really fun. I mean, we had a nice, nice group for both of those. Um, let's see. We're getting ready to do concession stand for the fishing derby. We're hoping that is a go this year. That's in May. Um, and then we're getting ready for the eighth grade dance. So we're trying to gather some parents to join us in a committee for that. And we have two vacant positions on the board for the upcoming uh, 2017 and 2018 school year. So we need a secretary and a treasurer. And we were supposed to meet tomorrow night, and I'm sure we'll meet next week, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> it's probably <laughs> canceled. <laughs> okay, Wheeler. Um, at that last meeting, it was a very brief meeting before the Wheeler presentation and the uh, or the project presentation that was in the gym. Um, I did talk to them, like Mr. White, I talked to them about the budget and how very important it was that they get to their town council and support it if that's what they're in favor of. They need to let them know this is a very important year. There's a lot of stuff going on at the state. So it's ever more important that you get to the public hearings. They had one last week, but that's before they do their work this week. They will have another one before the budget vote in April. It's important that parents get out and, you know, let uh, the town councilors know how you feel about the budget. Um, they're, going, they're going to have a April, that April weekend is very busy for pancakes. On Sunday, April 2nd, uh, Wheeler's having a pancake breakfast, plus they're going to be having a scholastic book sale. Um, 
And as you've already heard, their pack is in full swing. They'll be, uh, I think we're a little bit unsure, maybe it'll be a pack for all three projects, but they're getting that going, so please look for information there. And their next meeting will be uh, March 29th, 6 p.m. in the library. All right, correct counsel, Mrs. Tyrell? Yes, I attended the correct counsel on February 15th, and the majority of our conversation surrounded the budget and what's happening at the state level, which of course now is kind of different compared to what it was on February 15th. So. Um, next meeting is supposed to be Wednesday, so we'll see. Well, that'll probably be canceled too. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, under the chair's report, I don't have anything other than um, we talked at the last meeting, I believe, about um, the Crystal and Foster had brought up a possible <clears throat> self-evaluation of the board. Dr. Brum and I have talked about that. She is in the, in the process of looking for, because I know we had one a few years back where we had a facilitator come in and help us, sort of to keep us in, you know, on target, and we tend to, you know, veer off sometimes. So she's looking into that, and as soon as she has more information, we'll let the rest of the board know. And as you know, we're getting a very bad blizzard tomorrow, so hopefully everybody stays home and is, is safe. All right, next we've got a new business, board open forum. Does anyone have anything they wish to say? I would just like to make a comment on the STEM program here at the high school. I have the good fortune to see the work of uh, Mr. Fox and Mr. Gagnard uh, with their students at the STEM uh, robotics uh, at Wilby High School a uh, weekend or so ago. And not only are they working with technical expertise, but they also, it's a just a, excellent example of collaboration where the teams work with different teams throughout the day making judgments on which device is the best to do which typical task the task that these kids have to design a machine to do in six weeks is amazing they have to pick up balls they have to pick up gears and transfer them and then they've got to build a device that can also climb a rope and hit a switch and keep the light on turn the power off on the device and have it stay up there with a really clever ratchet that they put on the dedication <coughs> of these two individuals is just outstanding and uh, they are it just is an excellent example of of, of good things in, in this system that the schools really do rock and Mr. Helming's work with the music tonight with, with his chamber singers is another excellent example of really that other aspect and really developing both STEM and STEAM in our school district is essential and I'm glad to see it moving forward. Anyone else? I, can just, I just wanted to thank everyone for the, for the tokens of appreciation. It's, a, it's an honor to serve on this Board of Education and see what Plainville's doing and I'm glad that, that we're here to support all the wonderful things that are going on in town. I had the opportunity um, this weekend to go with the Plainville High School Jazz Band to their jazz festival up at the University of New Hampshire. Um, we're a small group. There's under 20 kids. They're a small group. And some of the groups before them were huge. But our group got up there, and they were just awesome. They had that full sound. They did a great job. I um, got a lot of feedback, too, because there were judges that were sitting with their microphone the whole time, just bip, 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 bip. You know, it was kind of interesting. I'm like, I want to know what they're saying. But they did a great job, and they're also a well-behaved group. Um, we stayed in the hotel with them, and at breakfast, they were just a great representation of Plainville. So, thank you. Mr. Talata is awesome, too, for taking those, those kids there. <laughs> um, I would also just kind of echo Mr. White's comments, um, like Mr. Helming bringing his group here, that's um, it's always very enjoyable to hear some performances and thank you to all the staff involved in, in our uh, appreciation month. I know it's not, um, it's not easily done and I do always say that whenever I go to Crick Council, people say, you, did, you had what? <laughs> so other districts don't always do this for their board members and we, we do appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> This presentation tonight um, from the elementary principals is just such a great example of some of the things that we do here. And I think it starts with learning communities and the innovative practices and the ability to be innovative and the ability to think outside the box. And I kind of love the fact that everybody's doing something a little different. Um, 
and it trickles on down, and maybe it doesn't just trickle, I think it pours right on down to the students, you know, to see a fifth grade student doing their own, um, you know, teacher conference like that, and being able to understand what they're learning and, and think about their learning in such a different way, to listen to the way they're discussing a math problem. And I, and I perfectly understand what Foster said about how he feels like if he had done that, he would have been better at algebra. I kind of really can kind of see the way, you know, that whole thinking process is working as opposed to the way we used to teach math. So um, really appreciate everything that's being done and, and uh, you know, being done at such a, you know, at just such a high level. Everything we're doing is such a very high, high level of thinking. I really appreciate that. And then just lastly, um, I know most of us went to the Day on the Hill. Many of us at least went to the Day on the Hill. Um, we are there to advocate for Plainville and for boards of education and um, at the state level and uh, you know, for making sure that that funding stays in place to keep our districts in place so we can continue to do what we're doing. And we do keep an eye on that. I know we, uh, superintendent set up a meeting with our representatives the week previous to that as well. Um, so uh, that's something that the board always keeps us, you know, keeps our eye on as well. I want to let that pass by without mentioning it. So, thank you. Well, I just wanted to just add quickly to what Becky just said, and I think uh, a lot of representatives spoke that day. They came in, state senators, state representatives, and I think the consensus is that they realize education <coughs> is important and that they will do what they can do to keep everything in place and not to decimate it as, as was proposed by a governor. So we're going to... Like she said, we're going to keep looking out. Dr. Brummett updates us all the time on stuff she hears about the state. We're in constant contact with our state representative, our senator, our uh, Dr. Pettit. So we'll, uh, <coughs> she's right, we'll just keep an eye on that because we want to know as much as everyone else uh, where the budget stands. So thanks for bringing that up, Becky. Anyone else? All right, we'll move on. Mr. Adlerstein, our quarterly special ed report. Thank you. So this is uh, special ed tuition within within the special education part of our budget. Um, the special education part of our budget is about $5.9 million, sizable amount of our budget, maybe just a segue from some of the words you just spoke. It takes a lot of innovation and outside the box thinking to take care of those students. Um, and so I'm, I'm here to report on the cost aspect of that and specifically on, on tuition. And the, uh, the cost aspect of the special education budget and tuition is very hard to predict. It's the hardest part of the budget to predict because so much is in flux. The children's um, situation can change quickly and it often has a financial impact. Vicki Trzinski is here. We talked just a few days ago and she talked about three children in particular whose situation is in flux. And depending on how that plays out, it will impact our budget one way or another. Right now, um, with what we know, we're forecasting the end of the year that there will be a budget impact of about $100,000. Our plan for that $100,000 is to cover it with other lines in the special education budget. So with, with the tuition line, we're predicting a $100,000 impact, negative impact, to be covered by other lines in the special education budget. Just a little more background, we have uh, 38 students who are currently outplaced or receiving outplacement services in one form or another. A little background for you, DCF placements aside, um, state eligibility for reimbursement starts with each student at $66,863. That means that first $66,863 is on us for those high cost placements. Above that, we don't get fully reimbursed. And how much we get reimbursed is never known until it actually happens. Usually in May, we, we have a very good insight. Until May, we don't. The reimbursement rate is between 70 to 80 percent um, year to year. Last year was closer to 80 percent. This year we've been warned that it's closer to 70 percent, maybe 73 percent reimbursement. So when we take that reimbursement cap into account and we take into account the fluctuation right now, that's how we come up with about a hundred thousand dollar impact. Uh, <clears throat> and I just want to reiterate that this is a sizable part of the budget. It takes a lot of creativity and hard work from Vicki and her staff to manage it. And um, stay tuned. Questions? Yeah, I actually have a question. The expected choice reimbursement, it says, is negative 284,000. I know we got that 100,000 cut 
in September. Is there an additional cut somewhere? Actually, that's not negative. It's a reimbursement. So think of that. Oh, as okay. An sorry. I'm sorry. It does say reimbursement. That's okay. The, the brackets are because it's an offset. Gotcha. Okay. So that offset combined with um, excess cost, which is the offset I was just talking about, um, is is netted into our tuition numbers. So we haven't lost any more choice money, just the 100 from September. Okay. Correct. All right. Sorry. All right. Just double checking. No, that's a good question. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next, um, I just need a motion for C. Motion to approve the Wheeler School Renovation Project, the Middle School Roof Project, and the High School Paving Project. Second, second the motion. All right, I have a first and a second. Do we have any discussion? Any more discussion? All right, all those in favor? Oh, hang on. Oh, one, go ahead. One, one thing. Sorry. Um, <laughs> you're really quick. Um, just, just to say, uh, that obviously this is a project that really needs to be done. I think this brings the district almost full circle in, in the work that has been done and the condition of the other buildings. Um, you know, at some point we still will need to uh, deal, deal with a bigger issue at the middle school um, in the near future, but this really uh, brings certainly elementary, elementary schools into uh, alignment. I know the, there's definitely some need here at this building as far as um, you know, the site work outside the paving and that kind of thing is, is definitely a concern. Um, and I would just urge the council when they do set this and move this forward to hopefully keep this as one yes. question um, and keep all the projects together. They all need to be done. And that would definitely help, um, I think, expand support. Yes. So that would be my recommendation. And timing is of the essence on this project. And just in case people don't understand that uh, what Becky alluded to, the council does have the option of putting it as one question or putting it as three questions. And there are people out there that are encouraging them to put it as three questions, which means that you can pick and choose which projects you want to do. That's why we would like them to keep it as one so that it is one school project, which includes everything. And again, there will be a public hearing. The referendum date is June 6th, but there will be plenty of informational sessions and a public hearing for everyone here to go and speak to the council and let them know your feelings. So. Just stay tuned, stay tuned for that. We'll definitely make sure we publicize that and let you guys know. Okay, any more questions or discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, next, um, D. Dr. Barber, did you want to say anything before sure. about our Wall of Honor nominee? Thank you. Or inductee, I should say. Yes, on April 17th, right before our April board meeting, the uh, members of the Plainville Selection Committee and the Board of Ed will honor Mr. Cadwell Hurl as the next inductee to the Board of the Meritorious Wall of Honor. The plaque will read, in recognition and appreciation of Cadwell Caddy Hurl, a role model for what a true community leader should be. He was a man above reproach, selfless, a problem solver, and a dedicated volunteer. His priceless contributions have impacted generations. So we look forward to celebrating uh, Caddy Hurl on April 17th. Okay, let's need a motion. Motion to approve Mr. Cadwell Hurl as the inductee to the Wall of Honor. I think second that motion. All right, I have a first and a second. Any discussion? All right, um, I just had one note. I noticed on the resolution at the bottom, the uh, uh, Nicole uh, Brent's still listed there. Nicole is not. So I don't know if you need to replace her. Or yeah, I've okay. Okay. Oh, that's no problem. All right, I just wanted to make note. Okay, thank you. We won't forget you. Nicole. Thank you. I appreciate that. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right. Next, uh, motion for the consent agenda. Motion to approve the consent agenda is listed. Second the motion. All right. I have a first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Last but not least. Motion to adjourn. Second. I have a motion, uh, first and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening.